Turn to the book of Revelation. That's the last book in your Bible. You know, Revelation is that uh, book in the Bible. It's just uh, really, every book in the Bible is amazing, but it's really amazing. And, um, you know, it deals with uh, things that are coming at the end. And um, we're going to begin in Revelation 1, verse 10. This is the Apostle John speaking, and he's, he's a prisoner. He's in his 90s, and he's on the Isle of Patmos for his testimony for Jesus Christ. And in verse 10, Revelation 1, verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and... What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. It is a wonderful to be here. Lord, we pray that you'd bless the fathers, Lord, um, and perhaps some still have living fathers in the distance. Lord, um, help them, Lord, to somehow bless them this day. Maybe it'll be with a phone call. Maybe it'll be in some other way. God, um, thank you for our dads. Lord, you know that uh, our dads weren't perfect, Lord, but Lord, they sure helped us. God, we sure appreciate that. Now, Lord, as we look at your book, um, Lord, let your word be alive to us this morning. And may we walk away with something from thee. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 12, it says, John turned to see the voice that spake with him. And being turned, he saw seven golden candlesticks. Look at verse 20. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the seven candlesticks were these seven churches that he mentions. It's the number seven. You know, there were seven churches there and, you know, seven is the, the number of completion. You know, God made the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Everything was complete. You know, you see the church in these two chapters in its completion. You see the church from every angle. You see the entire spectrum of the churches. And it's the seven golden candlesticks. You know, gold is the most precious of all metals. It is the standard. We speak of the gold standard. From the standpoint of heaven, the church is one of the most valuable things on earth. In Acts 20, Paul says to the Ephesians, he's talking to them, and he mentions the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. Man, the church is very valuable to our Lord. Seven golden candlesticks. You know, it doesn't say seven golden candles, although, although you know, that's, that's part of the picture. But it's the candlesticks. And the, the purpose of a candlestick was to hold up the candle. It was to hold up the lamp. It was to give light. Look at Matthew 5. Keep your place in Revelation because we're going to come back to that. But look at Matthew 5 for just a moment. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 15 Matthew 5, verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. The purpose of the candlestick is to hold up the light. It's to hold up the light. You know, one of the things that we're going to talk about as we go through this, and uh, I, I think hopefully we'll, over the next Several Sundays, we're going to take a look at these churches. Um, 
one of the things you see is they, they picture churches and individuals. And, um, you know, the church was to hold up the light. You know, the Lord saved a demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5. And he is just newly saved. And uh, he looks at the Lord, and man, the Lord has transformed his life. And he says, Lord, I, I really want to hang out with you. And, you know, most of the time, the Lord welcomed that. Most of the time, the Lord was telling people, follow me, follow me, follow me. But when this guy said, Lord, I want to hang out with you, the Lord said, well, he said, no. He said, I want you to go home to your house, to your friends, and I want you to tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. So the Lord gives a man who is demon-possessed, who is just saved. You know what he does? He gives him a candlestick. He says, man, I want you to hold up the light. You know, in Luke 19, you have uh, Zacchaeus, and he gets saved, and he is just newly saved. And man, he becomes a light. You've got an immoral woman in John chapter 4, that Samaritan woman. You know, the Lord looked at her and said, you've had uh, five husbands, and the man whom you're with now is not your husband. And before that chapter is out, she is converted but not only is she converted, she, she goes to the men of the city where she had been and she begins to tell them about Jesus Christ. And people come out of the city because they want to see this man that, that she is talking about. I mean, she is just newly saved. And you know what she does? She takes her light and God gives her a candlestick. Paul gets saved in the book of Acts. He was a hate-filled persecutor. And man, he is, he gets saved and immediately he is in the temple. He is preaching straightway. He preached that Jesus was Christ and man, he's got a candlestick. The Lord gives him a candlestick. You know, none of these people, he didn't, the Lord didn't wait. You know, he didn't send them to Bible school first. He didn't uh, put them on a period of probation. Uh, he just gave them a light and he said, uh, he said, I want you to shine it. Look at um, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4. You know, when you get saved, you are, the Bible says, you're translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear son. And um, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, somebody gets saved, you got saved. You know, if you're here this morning and there was that day where you knew you were a sinner and uh, you heard the gospel and you turned to Jesus Christ, um, you know what God did? Man, he, he gave you light um, and he, he shined in our hearts and man, there's a lot to learn, and there's a whole pile of growing to do, and, and we're doing that all our life. But, um, but you know what he gives you right off the get-go? He gives you light in your heart, and he says, don't hide it there. He says, I'm going to give you a candlestick. He said, I want you to put it up where people can see it. It's light. And it's that whole thing of, man, we go from the light in our heart to the light that shines in the world. If you're saved this morning, you've got that light in your heart. Man, you remember what it was like to be in the dark. And once I was blind, but now I see, and he's given you light. But man, uh, he gave it to you so they wouldn't stay in your heart. So that you, yeah, you, you'd shine it. That somehow people would see you and hear you and want you and they'd see something of the light, of the light. You know, it's interesting as we'll, as we'll read through the, the books, the churches there in Revelation, it says he, he warned each one of them. And um, he said, you know, you need to take care of this or that. And he said, you need to do that or I will remove your candlestick. He said, I'll remove your candlestick. I, I remember um, a lot of years ago, I was in my 20s and I was um, on deputation and I was, you know, raising support. So I was going from church to church. And there were a few years there where, man, I was in a lot of churches, usually just for one night or one morning. And uh, you just then you travel on to the next one. And I remember one Wednesday night I pulled up 
uh, I was early, and um, I was in Ohio somewhere, and I pulled up to this church. And, you know, you got to remember, this was back before the days of uh, even cell phones. And, um, and you know, you, you didn't look up the church and see a picture of the church. and No, no, no. You just, you had an address. And if you had talked to the pastor on the phone, and you didn't know what you were rolling into. You know, some of them were small, some of them were big, some were in a motel room. You just, you just didn't know what you were rolling into. And uh, that night, as I rolled into the address, it was this massive, huge, gray, concrete building. And I remember thinking to myself, man, this is amazing. You know, I'm going to get to preach in a big church tonight. And I was just picturing, you know, a thousand people sitting there, you know, and, uh, you know, when you're 20 years, you know, when you're 25 years old, you know, and you know, that's pretty exciting. And um, so it got a little later and got a little later. And, and finally, it was 15 minutes till seven. There's hardly any churches in the parking lot. All of a sudden, the preacher rolled in. A few other cars rolled in. And we went in the building. And um, that, that church would seat over at the, just like this building. I mean, the auditorium, the, the auditorium in this building, I think that the fire code is 1,100 people. So, I mean, it'll, it'll seat a lot of people. And, um, but that night, there were less than 35 people there, and we were in a Sunday school room. Like, not this kind of a room. We were in a Sunday school room. After church, we went out to eat, the preacher and I. And... Uh, you know, he was, he told me the story of the church and, and uh, man, some folks in leadership had sunk that ship. I mean, they had destroyed it and he was trying to rebuild it. And he was really happy because, you know, at that point in time, he said, you know, on Sunday mornings, we're, we're back up to about 200 people now. You know what God had done and God still does it. He took away the candlestick. What had once been a bright light. And God looked down and God is patient and God is gracious. And I'm sure God dealt with people and God, God tried to get him to fix the problem, but they wouldn't fix it. And you know what God did? did? Did those people lose their salvation? No, the light was still in their heart. But he took away the ability to shine for Jesus Christ. You know, what a privilege it is to be given a candlestick. Look at Revelation chapter 1 again. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. Read with me again at verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I, it's the Lord Jesus speaking, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergus, Pergamus, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And of course, this is the Lord Jesus. Uh, John says, when I, when I recognized who he was, I fell at his feet as dead. And he said, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead, and I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and death. This was the Lord Jesus. But where is the Lord Jesus? Chapter 2, verse 1. He walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Where is the Lord Jesus? In this book of the end times, where is he? He's in the midst of the churches. He is walking there. He is present 
He is observing. He's noticing everything. He's instructing. He is fair. You know, we, you know, we, we say that and we say, you know, life isn't fair. And, and, and I, I understand, we all understand what that means. You know, boy, different people have different lots in life and all that stuff. But when the Lord addresses the churches, you know, the Lord, he is really fair in his assessment of each church. He, he points out all the good and he points out what is lacking. I mean, he's not just breathing down their neck. He's not just finding fault. You know, some people, they, you know, it, it's not hard to see what's lacking. It, it's not hard to see the weaknesses. It's, it's you know, we're, we're just, those things really stand out to us. But boy, there's people that they just, they just never, they, they don't see the good. They just see the dark side. But you know, our Lord isn't like that. He is fair. He looks down and he sees the good. And he sees the bad. He's walking in the midst of these churches. And he's very clear. He's very specific. You know, he doesn't just throw out vague instructions to these people. No, he's very, very specific. And he is speaking. You know, he's, he's got some things he's not happy with in these churches, but he's not giving them the silent treatment. He's speaking to them, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Bible is a book for all people, for all time. Those churches in this chapter, they existed at that immediate time. And they also seem to picture church history. If you start, you know, looking at those seven churches, you know, in, in, in the order that they're given, they seem to represent church history. But the book of Revelation is, it was future. He says, I, I, he says I'm going to write to you things that must shortly come to pass. They show seven types of churches. And the Holy Ghost highlights certain folks in each church. You know, it is about the churches. And yet, as you read each description of each church, the Lord points out some people in those churches. There are certain types of folks in each of these churches, both saved and lost. And the Lord, the Lord points that out. You know, churches are made up of people. And the individuals are what makes up the personality of that church. They're what give the church its flavor, its atmosphere. You know, every church has a personality. Um, um, somebody came up to me a week or so ago, I can't remember, and, and they were talking about um, different churches. And, um, and he was asking me about the churches in the Edmonton area, you know, and he said, uh, he said, so, you know, are there, there are several independent Baptist churches? And, and he began that commentary. And, um, and uh, you know, one of the things that we discussed was, you know, a lot of the churches, a lot of the independent Baptist churches would, would on paper, they believe very similar things. But every church has its own personality. Um, I remember being at my, my mom's church many years ago. And when my mom passed away a few years ago, but I, I remember on one of the visits to go back home and um, it was in West Virginia. And um, uh, that church was actually the same church my dad had gotten saved in many years before. But, you know, a few pastors had rotated through all, all good men. And um, so I went to see my mom. That church would probably seat 200 people. On a Sunday morning, you'd have maybe 150 people there. And um, we were there. Uh, on a on a Sunday night, I believe it was, and um, but most of that church was elderly people, and uh, they loved the Lord, and they were doing a good work, and they were supporting the work of the Lord. They cared about the work of the Lord. That church had a radio broadcast uh, that blanketed that whole area, and um, those folks were doing what they could for the Lord. Um, and uh, but there weren't very many young families in that church, and. Uh, 
I remember after church, uh, we were we were up at the front. So, you know, here's the front of the church, and uh, here's, you know, Mitzi and I and, and a couple of kids, and here's my mom, and we're standing here talking to somebody. We're facing the front of the church. They had said the closing prayer five minutes previous. Five minutes. And you know how we are around here. I mean, we stand and we visit and we talk, and um, occasionally we have to sort of put people out the door, and that's only because usually somebody's coming in behind us, you know. But we all love to stand and visit and fellowship. We were talking about the meeting last year with the Nova Scotia guys. The last night, I mean, we had people here till 11 o'clock. And by the way, that's a sign of a very healthy Christianity. When God is more important than the clock. Oh, he, he likes that. He likes it when people want to linger in his presence. And I, I know people, some people drive a great distance and not everybody can hang around. So I, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just saying, you know how it is around here. Well, it's been five minutes. And uh, we're standing here talking. And I turn around and the church is empty. And the janitor is standing at the light switch, literally with his hand on the light switch. And I looked at my mom and I said, I guess it's time to go. Uh, you know, every church has a different flavor. There's some churches, uh, I'm talking about independent Baptist churches, okay? That's what I grew up with. I know those churches. I mean, I've been in independent Baptist church since I was six years old. And uh, boy, some of those churches, uh, we, we were in churches where there was a lot of wealthy people and uh, that n- nothing wrong with having money if it's God's. I'm just saying, and I can remember there was just an air about one church we attended that if you didn't drive the newest car and if you weren't part of that group, you were just part of the peasants. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody ever said it. But there was an atmosphere. My wife and I walked into a church in this province back before we moved to Alberta. So that would have been, you know, 2011, right in there somewhere. And we wanted to get a feel for, um, you know, what was going on in this province. And, uh, and originally, some of you folks will remember, we thought we were going to wind up in Lethbridge. And that's another story. But I, me and I, I had missed the Lord's signals majorly. But I, I thought, so we, we, uh, we checked out some, some of southern Alberta. One morning, we, we walked into this church down there, and um, they were meeting in a rented facility, just like us. And um, we walked in, and my wife and I, we, we sat up on the second or third row. And, uh, you know, surely, slowly but surely, people trickled in, and there were 70 or 80 people that morning. And um, honest to goodness, nobody said boo to us. We, we were sitting there, and as people trickled in, everybody would come in. It's an independent Baptist church, okay? Just, just like us. Ha ha. And everybody sits down. <laughs> Nobody said hello. Nobody introduced himself. The preacher got up. He did his deal. And after we got all done, and, and they had some sort of a little fellowship after the church, and, and um, uh, Mitzi and I wound up, you know, we, we had some things we had to do that afternoon. We wound up at the store and I looked at my wife and I said, what do you think? She said, I felt like I was in a funeral home. I dare say there's not much light shining there. You know, churches are made up of people. And the people are what give it its atmosphere and its personality. And the Holy Ghost in these two chapters, he highlights the different people that are in each church. Because in each one of these seven churches that all existed at the seven time, at the same time, and yet they were so different. And the reason they were so different was in part because of the people that were in those churches. Look at verse 18 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. Verse 18, the Lord Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things 
which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. You know, he, he names three things there that John was supposed to write down. The first was the things which thou hast seen. Well, well, what had John just seen? He had just seen the glorified, risen, heavenly Jesus Christ in all his glory. He had just seen that. And so he, he writes that. He describes that. The things which are, that's the present and the immediate. And that's those, those churches. Look at verse 11. Notice the wording. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are. That's the present and the immediate. And then you have in verse 19, and the things which shall be hereafter. And that's the, the term uh, that God uses for the long term, for the things coming at the end. Look at chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And John writes those things. That's the, that's the, the term for those things that were way out there in the future. Keep your place there and look at Daniel chapter 2 with me. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And somebody's going to say you missed Lamentations. Yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> Daniel chapter 2. Man, you know, we, uh, we preached through the book of Daniel uh, about a year ago. And... Uh, you know, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed going through the book of Daniel. And, you know, you've got those Bible stories, and then you've got a lot of prophetic things. But you know what I didn't know that preaching through Daniel was going to do? I didn't know, man, was it ever going to rattle some cages. And um, it sort of helped us clean out the church a little bit. And um, uh, it was amazing, you know. Um, the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel 2, verse 27. Of course, this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and uh, he's looking for somebody to tell him the interpretation, and so God brings Daniel to the forefront to do that. Daniel 2, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be, and watch the phrase, in the latter days. Thy dream... And the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Now, I, I just want to stop here. Uh, actually, yeah, this is going to seem a little random. Okay, so just, just uh, bear with me for a minute. If you've got a pen and paper... I want you to write something down, if, if you don't mind. I'll give you 30 seconds. One, two, three. I do not, I don't know that I've ever done this except in private. But I want you to write something down. There's a YouTube channel. You say, Pastor's losing his marbles. No, no, I'm not. Write down power and might. And that's George Antonius's YouTube channel. Many of you remember. Counsel. Oh, counsel and might. Well, praise the Lord. C-O-U-N-S-E-L. -E counsel and might. Yeah, I might have really put you in a wrong place there. <laughs> counsel and might. Uh, many of you remember George Antonios. He's preached for us on uh, uh, three different occasions. 
And, um, and so you've written that down. Write down the dirty word among Christians. It will be one of the best 90 minutes that you have spent in a long time. <clears throat> Several people watched George and Tony's and, and they've come and they've told me, and, and we, man, we've known George. George is Lebanese. George was in Lebanon in their civil war. And man, George has watched all sorts of things. His dad was the head of uh, one of the paramilitary groups there many years ago and all that stuff. So man, there is a lot of history there. And George really understands the Middle East. And um, George grew up in that place where they say, a good Jew is a dead Jew. He grew up there. Man, George got up here and he preached uh, when he was with us. And uh, the, the first morning he ever preached for us, he preached something about, you know, getting things right with your brothers and sisters. And, and, uh, and it was an amazing message. And we had, we had somebody sitting over here that's usually very stoic and very unemotional. And man, there were tears coming out of their eyes. God had touched their hearts. It was so amazing. And that night, George got up and he preached on the whole thing about how he was a Gentile dog and how God had, you know, he said, one of the first things God had to teach me was that I was a Gentile dog. And man, that same dude that had been in tears that morning left the service. He didn't come back to another service. He was riled. You know why? Because he didn't like the Jews. You need to watch that video because he, he's done his research and he hits every angle of all the YouTubers who give you all these reasons why the Jews are not the people of God. And he'll tell you what's wrong with the state of Israel. And he'll tell you, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of truth to some of what they say, but he said, but he says, but what does the Bible say? And man, you want a heavy duty course in what the Bible says? I just want to encourage you, if you have the least bit of an open mind, it'll be a good 90 minutes. And the dirty word is Zion. Be a good watch. The latter days, hereafter. Look at verse 44 of Daniel 2. When you walk into George and Tony's church, he's got an Israeli flag on the back wall. I feel inspired. <laughs> you say, what will that do? Oh, that will rile some people up and, and it will keep us on track. That's what that will do. Look at verse 44. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. See what a lot of people do with a lot of these prophecies. They say, they say, well, you know, the fulfillment of that prophecy was short term. And the answer to that is that's true. Many times there is a short term fulfillment, but many of those prophecies have a double fulfillment. There is a short term fulfillment. There is a long term fulfillment. Look at verse 44. And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So man, he's talking about way out there in the future. Verse 45, for as much as thou sawest the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Man, he says in the book of Revelation, see, here's what people do with the book of Revelation. They say, they disagree with the fact that it was written in AD 90. And they say, well, it really, it was written in AD 70 and all those prophecies were about the destruction of Jerusalem. No, that's not true. John was 90 years old on the Isle of Patmos. And Revelation is about the things which would be hereafter way out there. Look at Matthew 26. Look at Matthew 26. Matthew 26. We're going to hurry here. Matthew 26, verse 
59, Matthew 26, 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. In other words, you said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Man, that hereafter is, was way out there. We, in Revelation 2 and 3, we are in that present and immediate zone. We are in those seven churches. We are in the church. The church disappears from view as chapter 4 opens up. And in chapters 4 and 5, suddenly we are at the throne. And chapter 4 opens up, and we are in the hereafter. So you know where you're at right now, you and me? We are living on the edge of hereafter. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. We are on the edge of the hereafter. We are now. That's where we're at. Look at verse uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now... We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. You know, we are living in now. We are living in the things which are, and the Lord Jesus is, is walking in the midst of the churches. And he wants us to hear what he has to say because that's, that's for us. In these churches that he mentions, in these seven churches, these are not seven brands of churches. These are not seven denominations. He did not write, you know, one of them wasn't like the Baptists and then the Methodists and then the, you know, the Pentecostals and then the, then the United and then the, you know, that's not what this is. These are not seven denominations. These are seven churches. They all existed at the same time. And they all started at the same place. Every real church starts at the same place. It starts with the book. It starts with the blood of Jesus Christ. And it starts with the blessed hope. And each church has a personality. And every church is safe as it stays where it started. That's why the Lord said... Uh, you know, over and over to into us, he said, to abide, to abide. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. You know, God loves the church. Um, he did not scrap the tabernacle because of Eli and his sons. You remember in the Old Testament, you know, um, you had that story, but you know, right as Samuel is born and, uh, and his mom dedicates him to the Lord and takes him to the, to the tabernacle, but there was a problem. The tabernacle was the place of worship in Israel at that time. And man, it was corrupt. And, um, you know, God didn't look down and go, oh man, they've really messed up my plan. I, I guess I'll have to come up with another one. That's not what he did. God loves the church. Yeah. Look at Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians and when I say that, when I say this, you know, right away, right away, you know, people will acknowledge that, but, but they default into this thing where, where, you know, the church is the body of Christ and it's invisible and that's all that it is. And I, I believe the church is the body of Christ. Man, I believe the, the trumpet's going to sound one day. 
and we're going to go up and we are going to be the body of Jesus Christ. No question about that. But, but you know, the church, Christ died for the church. He loved the church and he has all these local churches which are just little manifestations of the main body. And you see that in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And there's other places where you can see it as well. Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, all the brethren which are with me, even all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Man, there's a whole bunch of them. You know what God does? God... Um, God calls to his people and God calls to his church as he did here. Um, and he directs and his spirit speaks. He says, he talks about what the spirit saith unto the, the churches. Can I get you to look real quick at 1 Corinthians 12? If you're still in Galatians, just back up. Just It won't be too many pages. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> he writes to the churches and, and the question was, um, he, the Spirit speaks. Would they, would they hear Him? Would they, would they do exactly His simple instructions? And that was the question for those churches. And the future of those churches hinged on that. It didn't hinge on, you know, whether, you know, uh, the, the, the big industry in their neck of the woods was going to close down and all of a sudden, oh, no, the church is going to close. No, it didn't hinge on that. God is not dependent on that. It didn't hinge on the political system. It didn't hinge on any. The, the candlestick, what kept that church a burning and a shining light would be God himself. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. This chapter is all about the church. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now ye, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Now ye are the body of Christ. Now watch. And members in particular. Members in particular. The Spirit speaks to the church. The things that are true of every church, all these churches that he writes to, they're also true of every person in particular. Because what is the church? It's you. It's me. That's the church. You know what the Spirit is doing when we get together? He's giving us a wonderful social event so we can walk home and feel good and bring food and feast and donuts after church. You know what that is? That's just a, that's just a blessing. That's just a blessing. Why do we gather? Because the Spirit wants to speak to His people. Will we hear him? Will we do exactly his simple instructions? As we go through these churches, you'll find that to each one of his churches, he usually said one thing, maybe two, that he wanted addressed. Now, can you imagine? There were only one or two things. No, there's a multitude of issues. But you know what the Lord did? He had one or two. He didn't give him a long list. He said, would you take care of this? You know what he's got in your life and mind? The devil wants to come on your shoulder and, you know, he wants to tell you, you know, oh, you got a thousand things. And he wants to discourage you before you start. And you know what? When you hear that voice, you'll just know that's not the Lord's voice. But when the Lord speaks to you, there'll be something real clear. He'll probably keep bringing it up to you. In fact, in fact, if you have any desire to connect with the Lord, just about the time you get on your knees, you'll feel like, oh, man, I... I feel like there's some distance between me and the Lord. And you say, Lord, uh, and you'll go, and it, you'll, it'll, it's right there. You don't have to guess. That's him. He doesn't give you the, the whole boatload. He says, you know, I got one thing. He says, if you'll fix this, it'll, it'll probably fix a whole pile of your issues. Would you do the first thing? In the book of Revelation, God deals with nations and eternity and the end of time and the churches and it shows what is all important to him. You know what? I close with this. You know what the most important thing about a church is? Programs are good, but it's not the programs. 
It's not the money. It's not about having a pile of musicians. That, boy, that's a blessing, but that's not what it's about. The most important thing about a church is, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself walking there. Is he in the midst? You say, Pastor, you know, I just think you're noisy. I think you guys are so radical. And you know what? I don't agree with all, you know what? And you, you can give me your list and, and God love you and I love you and I've, I've heard it before. Did you know, did you know If you, if you care anything about God's plan, you're going to find a church somewhere. What are you looking for? Boy, most people. I mean, back to when I was a teenager, I can remember. You know why people chose a church? They wanted to find one that had lots of programs for their kids because they didn't want to deal with their kids. Ha ha. That was the honest to God. Nobody would say that. Nobody even faced that. That's really what it was. You know, and there's always been criteria that people use to pick a church. And you know what? Some of those things are good. But the question is, does God speak to you? You better find a place like that. Don't find a place that makes you comfortable. He's probably not there. Jesus Christ raises from the dead. And on that resurrection morning, he's walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't even, they don't even know who he is because he's hid himself. But they find this visitor delightful. They find he opens the scriptures to them. And as he disappears from their sight after they bow to pray for the food, they look at each other and they said, you know what? Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures to us? You know what the church is about? It's about him. Do you know him? Do you love, did you come here looking for him this morning? You know, if you came looking for him, you can look past me. And I know there's a lot to look past. Talk to my wife. Can you see him? Is, is he speaking to your heart? Can you hear what he's saying? You know what? You need to talk to him. That's what it's about. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We love your book. We love your truth. And Lord, so very imperfectly, Lord, we love thee. Lord, if you spoke to somebody this morning, Lord, whatever, whatever you said to them, whoever it be, I, I hope you spoke to everybody, Lord. Lord, I know that's your desire. God, that we would all have ears to hear what your spirit saith. God, help us this morning that we might deal with, with you. That, Lord, suddenly this whole thing would be all about you again. God, that we'd realize, Lord, you gave us a light and you've given us a candlestick and, Lord, you want us to shine it for thee. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, the piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you, boy, talk to him. Is your Christianity about him? Oh, that's what he intended. Lord, thank you that you loved us. Thank you that you love the church. God, thank you for bringing us together. God, may we, may we be both individually and as a church. Lord, would you help us that we would be what you intended us to be, that we would be what would bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.